Our scripture reading today comes from James 1, through 25. But be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man who looks intently at his natural face in a mirror. For he looks at himself and goes away and at once forgets what he was like. But the one who looks into the perfect law, the law of liberty, and perseveres, being no hearer who forgets, but a doer who acts, he will be blessed in his doing. This is the word of the Lord. Please greet those around you as you're seated. Well, my name is Dr. Steve Snyder, and I taught for 40 years in the psychology department. And I retired, hey, yeah, yeah. And uh, I retired three years ago. And I just am so glad to be at home here at uh, Taylor University. I am so glad that I get to introduce a speaker uh, Pastor Taylor was first a mentee of mine about 11 years ago as he did his uh, studies at um, uh, Chicago and uh, Moody Bible Institute. And I had to do an internship and I got to do that with him for two years. And we've been friends for 11 years ever since. Uh, the other uh, few years ago, he became a pastor at Grace Community. Uh, and uh, we had talked about what is essential in terms of a church. And he felt like, and I agreed with him, that we just need to start our own church. And Pastor Taylor took that venture uh, at a startup church. And if you're, you're interested, um, he can tell you all about it, but Harvest Bible Chapel. And there's several things that we emphasize, and he particularly emphasizes at this church. And the first one is discipleship, that we need to work one-on-one, -on -one, small groups, to t nurture people in the Lord. And he uh, has nurtured, been nurtured, now he's nurturing other people. Amante is here, uh, and uh, he's nurtured him, and I've nurtured uh, Amante. And I think one of the greatest things that we can do in our jobs is nurture other people, and he's done that. Uh, he is uh, finishing up a seminary um, where he's working in the church and doing that, and I get the great honor of helping him in that process of learning. He has uh, his family here today, uh, Mel, and you can just wave, Mel, you don't have to stand up, with his children. Three of them, Israel is the youngest, and then it goes Eden, and the oldest is Willow. And I, and my wife gets the honor of being with these uh, kiddos, and uh, we, I meet with uh, Mel. The church is a community, and that's what Pastor Taylor does in his church. And now it's about 170 after two years. And I'm just so proud of him. Would you please welcome uh, Pastor Taylor Frank. Um, when Pastor Dyson called me, he said, we expect you to get us into the word, Pastor. And I was so encouraged to hear him say that. that we wanna get into the word, right? I'm so thankful for a leader like him in a university like this that still stands for the authority and the sufficiency of God's word, the Bible. That was a really good place for an amen. We I come from an old Baptist background. We say, amen, brother, right? You guys say that? You say that here? Amen. Bible, God's word. In fact, Bible is the middle name of our church, Harvest Bible Chapel. You can see a picture of it up there on the screen. Harvest Bible Chapel, two years old. You, you, you're welcome to attend. Check it out anytime. Um, I think it's up there. Harvest Bible Chapel. There it is. That's cool. It's this old building that we rent. It's beautiful. Some of you were there this past Sunday. It's just expository preaching in a relational environment. That's the best way I could describe it to you. And uh, my wife and I love hosting all the college students from our church in our home once a month. We love doing that. And you would be invited to that if you get to become a part of our church family. In fact, just this past fall, Dr. Michael Lindsay graced our pulpit. He preached. There he is preaching at Harvest. It was such an honor to have him. And getting to know him, the amazing work he's leading at Taylor. I just praise God for that. It's, it's remarkable. Um, in fact, one of our elders, we only have three elders, we're a church plant. One of our elders and his wife are both 2018 grads of Taylor University. So suffice, to, suffice it to say that TU has a really special place in, in my heart and in the heart and life of our church. And I'm honored to be here to speak to you this morning. So does anybody bring a Bible to chapel or is that not a thing? 
Yeah, because we read the scripture already. If you have a Bible, I would love it if you could just open it to James. Could you get to James with me? James chapter one. Could you do that? You're like, uh, you don't have to. Nobody's judging you. Don't look around. Don't give a scowl to the person next to you if they don't do it. But we are in James this morning. I'll meet you there in a minute. James is just four chapters long. It's written by James, the half-brother of Jesus. It was written in the AD 40 sometimes, which makes it the earliest New Testament book written. I thought that was really cool. Um, James is written to Jewish believers who'd been scattered all over the place due to persecution. Um, So he's addressing a biblically literate religious audience, evidenced by the fact that he uses that phrase brothers, 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 some 15 times in just four chapters. In fact, he alludes to the Old Testament 40 times and the Sermon on the Mount 20 times in these four chapters. It's a religious crowd, people not all that different from those who would come to a cold January chapel in 2024 in Upland, Indiana. Church people, raise your hand if you grew up in the church. You better grow up in the church. I did too. And my church was broken and imperfect. So was my family. But I'm so thankful for the foundation in God's word that I received through that growing up in the church. Um, so thankful for that. But, but, but why does James write? Why does he write this book? What is, what is he getting after? You can see on the screen, here's why. To urge believing people beyond theological knowledge and onto godly behavior. The word Reverend Dyson kept using last Wednesday was Maturity. Maturity. Why don't you just look at the person next to you right now and say, grow up. (laughs) Grow up. Somebody needed to hear that. Maybe it was your roommate. I don't know. Grow up, man. Grow up. Yeah, that's kind of the maturity is a good word for that. James writes, he's kind of like, oh, you have faith. How cute. Go live it out. That's kind of what James is all about. Um, Get the truth out of your head and into your life. James is like the Proverbs of the New Testament, it's been said, with just a ton of super practical, pithy statements about everyday life. I think Reverend Dyson called it like a Swiss army knife. There's just a little something for everything in the book of James. It's all about living out my faith, not just being a Bible-believing Christian, but a Bible-living Christian. I love to say we want to be a Bible-preaching church. That's good, right? But with that, we want to be a bible living church, right? Anybody on board for that? And that's why James writes. In fact, that's why the great Martin Luther, the great reformer, didn't like this book very much. Um, Did you know that? Church history buffs. Martin Luther did not like the epistle of James at all. That's why I wore this shirt. Do you see this shirt? He's got sunglasses. It says nailed it. You know, the 95 Theses thing. The The Protestant Reformation. So Martin Luther helped launch the Protestant Reformation, which of course was a return to a biblical gospel, justification by, oh, you guys are great. Faith alone, right? Faith alone. And James comes along and he's like, you got to do all this work for God, man. And Martin Luther's like, I don't, I don't love it. I don't love it. So he did accept it into the canon and he understood it should be there. He just didn't like it a lot. So I had to wear this shirt because I hope when I get to heaven, I can just tell Martin Luther, I preached James with your face on my chest. Just to be a punk, man. If he has a sense of humor, I I think he'll appreciate that. Maybe he'll have me over to his heavenly mansion or something. The gist of James is this. You can see on the screen. If your faith hasn't changed you, it hasn't saved you. If your faith hasn't changed you, it hasn't saved you. We can say we believe whatever we want, right? Anybody can do that. But your behavior, your lifestyle evidences or betrays what you really hold to be true. It's pretty simple, really. This is how it works. Stated belief plus actual practice equals actual belief. Can you, can you all help me with that? We got three, it's perfect, three sections. So this section over here, stated belief. When I point to you, you have to say stated belief. Let's practice, ready? Stated belief. Does the balcony get to play too or not? I don't know how this works. Okay, let's try that again with the balcony. The balcony, ready, ready, stated belief, ready, set? Stated belief. Okay. You guys are the actual practice crowd. Everybody can say actual practice. Ready, set. Actual practice. And then equals, you guys are going to be the actual belief crowd, including the balcony. Ready? Actual belief. Thank you. Let's, let's put it all together. Ready? Yes. Everybody remember your thing? Yes. Don't get it wrong. We're going to ask you to leave if you get it wrong. I'm just kidding. Okay. Same Plus. Actual practice. Equals. Actual belief. That's what it's all about. That's what James is all about. Um, I bet all of us here know that God is holy and we are sinful and Jesus saves. We know that is the gospel. We were just singing so beautifully about it, that we are sinners in need of salvation. And that's why God sent to be born to us on that day in the city of David, a savior 
who is Christ the Lord, which we just celebrated at Christmas time. Here's the deal, though. You can see it up on the screen. God doesn't just want to save me. He wants to change me. He wants to demonstrate, my pastor used to say, he wants to demonstrate through my transformed life the superiority of a life lived in Christ. He wants to change me. He wants to save you. Yes, God wants to save you. Probably almost everyone in this room would profess saving faith in Jesus Christ. God loves me just the way I am, Pastor Taylor. Yes, right? And the follow-up is too much to leave you that way, right? God wants to change you and me. Um, Change, the fancy Bible word for it is sanctify, right? To make pure and set apart. 1 Thessalonians 5, 4, this is God's will for you, your sanctification. Um, 2 Peter 3, 18 says, grow. Everybody say grow. Grow Grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. In Romans 8, 29, for those whom God foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son. Jesus. God doesn't just want to save us. He wants to change us. He wants to take your life and mine and sanctify it, grow it, conform it, change it into the image of his son, Jesus. So if that's true, if that's true, and we'd probably all agree that's true, I would hope, um, that if my faith is real, then it's going to work its way out through a changing life. What are some things, you can see this question up on the screen, what are some things God uses to change his kids? What are some things God uses I want to take 30 seconds of my preaching time here, so make it quick, for you to turn to somebody, sit next to you, make eye contact with them, say, hey, what's up? Think of one thing, listen, listen, think of one thing God uses in the life of his kids to change them, and share that with the person sitting next to you. You only got 30 seconds. Ready, set, go. Ten seconds, ten seconds. Three, two, one. All right, everybody get a chance to share? Yeah? How about somebody like, who's willing to be a little bit obnoxious from this side over here? What's, yeah. Prayer. That was amazing, man. That was awesome. Did you hear what he said? Prayer. God uses prayer. Tim Keller would have loved that answer. Prayer is not just supposed to be therapeutic, but it's transformational, real biblical prayer. Okay, somebody in this section? Consequences of your actions. Ooh, the consequence, the natural consequences of my actions. We might even lump that sometimes into the discipline of the Lord. He uses, you know, God, those whom the Lord loves, he rebukes and disciplines, right? Be zealous, therefore, and repent. God's kids get spanked, and, and that hurts, but it changes us. Right? I mean, do God's kids get spanked or not? Okay. <laughs> laugh at me up here. Okay. Somebody else. I love you guys. Okay. Somebody, I see a hand. People. People. Anyone in specific you'd like to name this? (laughs) Don't do that. Don't do that. My roommate, man. No, let me tell you all about him. No, people. God uses difficult people and sometimes helpful people to transform. My mentor, Dr. Steve Snyder was just up here. God has used Dr. Snyder to shape me and change me so much into Jesus. I'm a slow learner. It takes a long time for him to do that. But praise God. You know how Jesus probably would have answered that? Jesus prayed in John 17, 17 to the Father. Father, sanctify, that's that word, sanctify them by your truth. Your word is truth. And that's really the answer James gives as well. Every answer was right. The title of the message this morning is How to Be Changed by God. And we only have a few minutes left, and that's okay. How to be changed by God. We're going to see one answer, one big answer, maybe even the best answer to that question. How does God change his kids? We just heard read James 1.22. If you're there, you can, you can look at it with me. But be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. Verse 23 says, for if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he's like a man who looks intently at his natural face in a mirror. For he looks at himself and goes away. And at once forgets what he was like. Verse 25 says, but the one who looks into the perfect law, the law of liberty, and perseveres, being not a hearer who forgets, but a doer who acts, he will be blessed in his doing. How to be changed by God. If you're looking at a hard copy of God's word and you happen to have a pen or a highlighter or something, I would love for you just to underline or highlight or circle that word hearers. 
hearers, how to be changed by God. There are four things in this passage, four really simplistic things in this passage that show us a pattern for how to be changed by God. The first thing is this, humbly hear, humbly hear um, to be changed by God. James is assuming the hearing part in our passage this morning because you see how he phrases it, but be doers of the word, that's his focus and not hearers only. So, okay, so I have to be hearing. First base for doing God's word is what? Hearing it, thank you, it's not rocket science. By the way, he says, hearers of the word, not a word. You know, and I, and I get the, you know, the language semantics and stuff like that, but I'm not here to give y'all a word today. I, I would love to give you the word. You know, you might've heard it said before that if you wanna God, hear God speak audibly, the most sure way to do that is to read your Bible out loud right? The word. He says, be hearers of the word. The word. And that's the focus, to hear the word. You've got to be a hearer before you can be a doer. Um, really hearing, truly hearing requires humility. Have you noticed that? Certainly with anyone, certainly with God, humility, a humble heart posture, listening well to my friends, thoughts and ideas and struggles and concerns. It demands a lowliness of attitude on my part. Jesus called it, Jesus called it poor in spirit. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven, right? You and I stand no chance of seeing God radically work in our lives unless we humble ourselves and shut up and listen to him. Okay, why don't you all do this? You do that? Now do this. That's a sermon in a hand motion. Do it again. Ready? That's it. Um, was anyone here at the Passion Conference in Atlanta last week? Yeah. You were? Does that mean you were skipping your J-term class? Yeah. I want to talk to you right after this. I'm just kidding. Wasn't J-term already going last week? <laughs> so probably nobody went to Passion. You're like, I watched the live stream, right? Yeah. My sister was there. My brother was there. I've been to Passion. I remember in 2017, I was sitting in Passion. It was the Georgia Dome when that was still a thing. Now they're in the Mercedes Benz. But I remember Francis Chan stepping up to speak. Anybody like Francis Chan? I mean, if that guy's not the coolest, I don't know who is. And he gets up there to, to preach. And you know, it's all these excited college students and we love Jesus. And this is what he says. Check this out, this quote up on the screen. You can check it out on YouTube. Francis Chan, one of the most destructive practices of this generation is that you value your own thoughts way too much. You wanna look inside and tell everyone else what you've been thinking and what you've been feeling rather than opening up the word of God and saying, these truths are way beyond mine. He goes on, look at what he says. You value your own thoughts too much and it's killing you. He's saying this to 60,000 people like us, young people. One of the things we've gotta learn is to stop believing everything we think and everything we feel and to stop valuing that so much and valuing the word of God more because his thoughts are infinitely higher than ours, end quote. Oh, if you can't say amen, just say ouch, right? Ouch, he's preaching on Isaiah 53. God says, my thoughts are not your thoughts. My ways are not your ways. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my thoughts higher than your thoughts and my ways than your ways. I mean, is that in your Bible? That's in my Bible. And again, it's ouch. If you can't say amen, just ouch. That's a passage Francis was preaching on when he said that, you know, we value our own thoughts, he says, too much and it's killing us. Have you noticed that in 2024, literally like anybody can become a coach or an influencer? I mean, some of my friends and I joke about it. Become a certified church planter coach, Taylor. I mean, you did it for five minutes. Surely everybody needs to hear the right way to do it from you now. No, no, it used to mean something to be a coach or an, or an influencer. Isaiah 5 says, woe to those who are wise in their own eyes. Woe to those. Um, if I see one more of these things on the screen, ask me anything. You ever see that on your social media? Ask me anything, <laughs> you know? There might be, like, maybe a good motive for posting that, maybe somewhere, but I doubt it. I'm just kidding, I don't doubt it. Like, if you're Gre Greg Dyson or Jackie Hill Perry or Francis Chan, yeah, people want to know what you think. You're going to help us a lot. But for me and you, no, just delete it off your story right now. Go ahead, nobody's judging you, nobody's looking around. Just take it down. Like, everybody wants to sign up for what I think. That's what Francis Chan back in 2017 was kind of poking at, poking at. Proverbs 10, 19 says, when words are many, sin is not lacking. Check out this meme up here. I could have picked a, a thousand memes, you know. <laughs> no one, okay, nothing. And then 22-year-old Christian who's been married for two months. 
Marriage is hard. It's the hardest thing I've ever had to do. Sometimes I hate my husband. Sometimes I'm so repulsed by him that I want to barf. But it's so worth it. So blessed to be his heart, heart, cross, cross. Now, I'm not trying to be mean, I promise. I, Greg, I hope you have me back after this. I'm just being a goofball, right? But have y'all ever seen these kind of things on social media, right? It's like, oh, if I see another one of these things, I think I'm gonna be sick. It's like, who gave this poor young woman the idea that she should post anything like this? No, throw your phone in the ocean, don't do that, right? Like just this spirit, maybe we can blame social media. Guys, I love you, thank you for, maybe we should blame social media for giving us this false, this toxic idea that everyone needs to hear all the stuff I think. No, God forgive us. It's, guys, my prayer for you and for me is that because you came to chapel today, you would fall a little bit out of love with your own thoughts. Fall out of love with that man. Like Dr. Reverend Dyson said it last Wednesday, brother, I love that you said, it doesn't mean you don't have a voice. It doesn't mean you don't speak sometimes. The, the, the pausing right before we speak. I loved how he preached that last week. It doesn't mean you don't have a voice. It doesn't mean you don't think for God, but just a slowness to speak and to humbly hear from God, to fall out of love with all the stuff I think. I think a lot of stuff, don't you? And most of it's just not even worth it, man. I sat down at Starbucks at Gas City this morning with my own thoughts. No, I didn't. I opened my Bible. Right? And I'm not the most disciplined Bible reader, but I'm like, man, I got to read God's word. I got to hear from God this morning. Anybody else? I mean, are you with me on that? We might stink at doing it, but we know that's where it's at, man. That's where the money's at. James 119. <laughs> Let every person be quick to hear and slow to what? Slow to speak. That's not like food for thought. That's a command for God's kids. Quick to hear, slow to speak. God help us. You can see on the screen, Zechariah 2.13 says, be silent, all flesh, not just freshmen, all flesh before the Lord. That goes for me. That goes for Michael Lindsay. That goes for Reverend Dyson. Be silent. Look at the person next to you and just go, shh. Can we practice one more time? Ready, ready, ready? Mm-hmm. That's where it's at. Loved ones, look, I know our passage in James this morning is about doing the word. It's about, it's about applying the word. It's about doing. But in preparing for this chapel this morning, I just became so burdened by how much we stink, I stink, at first just hearing well from God in his word, in his word. And good luck doing it right if you're not hearing it right. I mean, is that fair? Anybody with me on that? So as I prepare to close, I just want to share four ways that I hear God wrong. The first one is this, hearing and evaluating. Hearing and evaluating. Instead of just humbly receiving, you know, you walk out of chapel and your buddy's like, so how was the sermon in chapel this morning? Oh, it was decent. Oh, it was amazing. Oh, it was terrible. You know what you just did in that moment? You placed yourself above the word that you just heard as the judge of it with your clipboard and your pen giving your mighty judgment, your verdict on how the word was in chapel this morning. You wanna get up here and preach next time? God, forgive me, me. I don't know hardly any Christians that don't do this at least a little bit. Hearing and evaluating. How was church? Oh, it was okay, I didn't get that much out of it, you know, whatever. Hearing and evaluating. Guys, I am all for discernment, being very careful about what we allow into our hearts and minds, but you can have biblical discernment without having a proud heart, okay? You can. You you can listen very carefully without listening too critically. How I hear God wrong, I hope this is helpful to you, hearing and evaluating. Secondly, you can see it on the screen, hearing for others. Instead of myself, I've grown out of this a little bit, but every now and then I'm still tempted to think, oh, how good it is that Brother Greg is hearing it this morning, or my wife, or my roommate who skipped the last three chapels. No, 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 no. Start with the mirror, right? God help us. Thirdly, hearing and just enjoying. Instead of applying it to my life, Instead of applying it to my life, I love listening to sermons. I do that in my free time a lot. But there's this insidious danger in just doing it because it's nice. People say at my church, Pastor, that was such a nice sermon. I enjoyed that so much. And I'm like, thank you. That's that's encouraging to hear. But that was not the point. The point of the message was that God's spirit would take his word like a double-edged sword and do some major surgery on us together. You know, not just enjoying it. Enjoying it, yes, I should delight in God's word. But beyond that, how does this apply to my life? Number four, hearing too much. Too much noise in my life. 
The volume is just ratcheted up from social media, from classes. Some of you all go to chapel three times a week, which is amazing. You're in three Bible studies. You go to your local church. You're in these Bible studies, maybe a Sunday school class. You're hearing so much from the world and from the word that you couldn't possibly hope to slow down and meditate and then apply what God's saying to you. Does that, has that ever happened to you? I think that's probably a lot of people in this room. The church I grew up at, it's like be there five times a week. It's teaching, 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 teaching. What a lot of you in this room need this morning more than another sermon is silence and solitude and service. You're on like a 4,000 calorie a week, a day diet when it comes to spiritual things and you're burning a couple hundred calories every day. And, and it's either puffing you up or it's putting you to sleep. Maybe what you need this J term, this semester, this summer is to decommit from a couple Bible studies or something. I know, doesn't that sound weird? And to really do less, hear less of God's word, and then obsess over it and apply it to your life. Everybody just say, hear less. Hear less. Then obsess. Then obsess. <laughs> then obsess. That's what some of you need. That's what some of us this morning need is to hear less and then obsess. Here's the rest of my outline. You can see it on the screen for the sermon. This was supposed to be the sermon. If you go to the next slide, that is the whole thing. Actively apply the word. Patiently persevere in the word. Be blessed in doing so. It's all in the text. You can find it on your own. You don't need my help to do so. I really believe that as modern young people like us, we're getting worse and worse and worse by the hour at hearing God's word. Do it with me one more time. That's it, at hearing God's word. That's how my outline started. This is how it's going. Next slide. That's it, man. Reverend Dyson, this is gonna have to be a four-part message in my church. Does that ever happen to you? And this is just part one, guys. Do it again. Mm -hmm. We have to be hearers. Then and only then will we ever hope to be faithful doers of God's word. I want to end with something Jim Cimbala told me this summer. I was sitting in a small room at the Brooklyn Tabernacle. Don't put it up there yet. Don't put it up there yet. Take it off. Take it off. Take it off. You cheaters. Don't read the quote yet. I have to tell you what the quote, you know, you know the context. Everybody say context. And we're going to be done. We're going to go. I was sitting in this room at the Brooklyn Tabernacle in New York. And Jim Cimbala was talking to a room of about 50 young church planters. And this is what he said. Everybody go, ooh. Okay, here it is. is it, no, but now listen, here it is. I love whoever you are doing this slide. You're doing amazing. <laughs> Most pastors' greatest fear is that someone will leave their church and never come back. Your greatest fear should not be someone leaving your church. Your greatest fear should be that someone would come to your church and stay, but never be changed, end quote. My greatest fear for you is not that you're gonna transfer to Indiana Wesleyan. I know. Listen, listen. You go, what? That should be his greatest. No, 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 no. My greatest fear for you, man, listen, listen, is that you'd come, that you'd stay at Taylor for four or five years, however long, and never be changed. Never be changed by God. My, my friend, I love you guys. If you're not hearing well, you're not gonna be doing well. And that is what the Lord led me to share with you this morning. Would you pray with me? God, please help each of these students and anybody in this room, Lord, to really process these words that the Spirit, your Holy Spirit, would massage these truths into their hearts. Sanctify us by your truth, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, before you go, we're gonna end with something we do at our church. I always ask people almost every Sunday, what's one thing that stood out to you personally from the message? And I want you to turn to somebody seated next to you and tell them your thing. Once you've shared, you can be dismissed. But first, you gotta make eye contact again with somebody seated next to you. Ask them, say, what was one thing one thing that stood out to you from Pastor Taylor's message this morning from James 1, share one thing, then you can be dismissed. Sound good? Yeah. Okay, have a great day, Taylor. Thank you. <laughs>